and Vic Kaplan. Welcome to Candidate Highlights. Uh, my name is Nathan Cole. I'm here with Vic Kaplan. We are both deputies of political affairs for the New Jersey Libertarian Party. I will be interviewing John Morrison, who is running for Congress in District 4. Hi, everybody. Um, as Nate just said, my name is John Morrison. Um, I'm running for the U.S. House of Representatives for Congress in New Jersey's 4th District, um, which uh, encompasses big parts of Monmouth County and Ocean County. Um, I currently live in Monmouth County. I have family in Ocean County. Um, I've been a public school teacher for the last 12 years, um, teaching history and civics. So this is something that obviously I hold close to my heart, and I can't wait to talk about you know all the things I plan on doing and the things that I'm running on. Um, besides, uh, besides your focus on civics, um, uh, why, like, why, uh, why are you running? Um, well. This kind of this goes back a little ways, but I, I always had this kind of dream, I guess you could say, of running for office. And uh, Congress in general, I think, was something I've been interested in since I was a kid. I always find that that's where you know real change happens in in Congress and in Senate. That's where our representatives are. And I got the chance last year in 2023 to run for state legislature, and I guess that was kind of a way of dipping my toes into the water mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. and i honestly had a blast doing it i think i ended up doing um you know much better than i anticipated myself doing and you know that's basically like getting the bug and i yeah. i wanted to do the next logistic step and and run for congress all right what does uh as as a libertarian candidate what does liberty uh uh in general and libertarian ideas uh, specifically mean to you I think, you, you know, when you ask somebody, what does liberty mean? Um, I think you'll, you'll get, you know, that, that kind of generic answer of, of doing what, a, you know, doing whatever you want, following your dreams. And I think it's actually bigger than that. I think to really think about liberty is to think about empowerment. Um, you have that ability with liberty. It's, you know, it's, it's not loud. Liberty's quiet. Um, it's confidence. It's, you know, the freedom to make those choices that you want to make. And in that freedom, you know, you find that you can explore different ideas. You know, you can kind of chart your own path um, without limitations. You know, there are there are no boundaries. You know, you go above those limits. Um, so without that kind of like shackled mentality, um, you kind of with liberty, you don't really have a spot in your mind or your life for fear. Um, so. You know, liberty is something that I, I I think the party does so well and literally naming itself the Libertarian Party. And that really is the sentiment of the party um, is shaped in liberty. And that's what I believe liberty to be. It's not something that is, you know, loud and in your face. It's something that's quiet, but it's confident. It's kind of it reminds me a lot of a mountain, you know, because mountains are, you know, something so powerful, but they don't move. So that's what I really find liberty to be. All right. What are your uh the top issues that you're running on. So in the fourth congressional district, we currently have, uh, I, I, I will say he is the longest serving member of Congress. I know he's tied for the longest, but I'm just going to say the longest. Uh, Congressman Smith has been in the House of Representatives since 1980. He was elected on the same day that Ronald Reagan was elected to his first term, just to let that number soak in. Um, that was seven years before I was even born. So the topic of term limits is something that's really, you know, cut out for me. You know, uh, he, you know, and I, I, I've said from the beginning, I will, I will never go after Chris Smith in terms of, of his track record because I, I know that there are people in my district that have voted for him 22 times and are confident in voting for him 22 times. But I think we've gotten to the point, and he's a perfect example of why term limits are so necessary. You know, we have term limits on our highest office in the White House, but we have no term limits for our members of Congress. So somebody can can literally sit in that position of power for, you know, over four decades and in a way kind of unchecked. You know, Chris Smith at this point doesn't really have to campaign for his job. You know, it's not like he's he's up against it like uh, me and the two other candidates are. and to kind of make it a more competitive 
way of people having in power, we have to have term limits for people that are in Congress. Um, you know, and also something else that that comes up a lot, and it's actually a question I got uh, through my website that I'll be I'll be making a video for re uh, soon because I think that this question um, needs a broader answer from me directly to this person. But I do believe in non-interventionism, and that is something that is obviously right in our faces today, considering that we are either funding or subsidizing for foreign conflicts that really don't affect American defense. Um, I think that the the burden of these things that are overseas, especially military conflicts, shouldn't fall to the U.S. taxpayer. Uh, and I know that people are very opinionated on these things. We we are a melting pot of a country. We have you know people still with family in these areas. We have we have people that have cultural significant backgrounds and ties to these areas. So when I say non-interventionist, I I get some pushback uh, a lot because. Uh, they think I'm I'm discussing like severing all types of ties with other countries, and that's that's not at all what I'm talking about. And non-interventionist is is to not get ourselves involved in their conflicts, diplomatic ties, human humanitarian uh, ties. All those things are still super important, and they can be achieved um, without uh, funding or subsidizing for other countries' military spending. Um, and another topic that uh, is, you know, near and dear to my heart, actually, I did a debate with, or sorry, political forum, I shouldn't call it a debate, because um, it was just a super uh, nice and uh, bouncing back forth of ideas with other parties. Um, but the topic of free speech came up. And I was kind of at odds with uh, my two fellow um, participants, where uh, I feel that uh, to limit free speech or to even talk about the idea of limiting free speech is something that should be considered unbelievably unnatural. The comparison kept getting kind of thrown back at me at, you know, where, where do we draw the line? Because if you're going to speak your mind, that's the same as yelling fire in a crowded theater. And I couldn't disagree with that statement anymore. You know, the, to, to think that speech and uh, you know, offensive things are calls to, violence, uh, that's up to the interpretation of the person who's listening to it. So by yelling fire in a crowded theater, you are literally causing panic by yelling fire in a crowded theater. Um, voicing your opinions and somebody not agreeing with it or or interpreting it wrong, I think, is on the person that that hears those things. And we're I'm, I'm afraid that this country is headed towards a point where the only things that we're going to be allowed to hear are the things that we're allowed to hear from those in power. And that's that is straight out of, you know, George Orwell's 1984. And that's something that I, I can't sit idly by and allow to happen. You know, they bring up misinformation all the time. Um, and if misinformation ends up being the only thing that we're allowed to hear, then we are absolutely headed down the wrong path. So those um, those are the three uh, big things that uh, my campaign that I will be standing on and discussing as much as I possibly can. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So, you, um, what policies? Uh, all right. So yeah, you kind of like went through like all my follow up questions that I yeah. that I would have had. Um, what uh, what policies would you do? Uh, would you um, endorsed to reduce the, the national debt? Uh, well, since since I've had I've had it running up on my screen, since we started talking, I think the national debt has gone up uh, a few million dollars since we, I think I started talking. So that is a, a serious, serious problem that I think needs the, we hear kind of all the time, you know, the national debt is, is getting out of control. Well, the ways to, to kind of curb uh, national debt is that we have to reduce our government spending. There's so much waste. If we sat down and we allocated and we actually look to see where our tax dollars are going and cutting or even scaling back, you know, entitlement programs, you know, things like social security, things like Medicare, things like Medicaid. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not all for cutting these things that do help millions and millions of people, but we have to find ways to reduce if, if we want, as I said, this rolling number to to stop. 
Um, we also have no amendment in the Constitution that that says that the government has to balance the budget. Um, we would need something that 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 would day and night. It would be if we if we wanted to limit spending, then we put something in the Constitution where our government has to balance that budget. They can't. They can only spend a certain amount. You know, there, there's only there's a limit to what our government is allowed to give, what our government is allowed to spend on. Um, and as I and as I said before, a, a a big way to reduce the national debt, or at least get people to notice um, that it's not going up, is that we end foreign military interventions. Um, this is a prolonged issue, and I I hear it all the time. People saying, "Well, you know, the United States is in too deep now. Everyone's expecting us to help." I understand that. This is this isn't like an easy, you know, hill to climb, um, but we have so much unnecessary spending. And if we want this debt to stop going up and start leveling out and even, a, dare I say, somewhat of a surplus we could possibly have one day, then we have to find the waste and we have to cut it immediately. And if that is too much for some people to hear, then we have to reduce where we are spending certain things. Um, how, how will your policies, uh, if enacted, uh, improve the lives of, of the American people? Well, it's right. I, I think you know most of us in the Libertarian Party can agree, and I, I know it's it's something that we talk about all the time. About uh, you know, I don't think you'll talk to a Libertarian where they don't bring up income tax. And you know, the reason we bring that up is because when we have those conversations, and and somebody will always say, you know, well, how could we possibly function without income tax? Income tax is not it was was not part of the United States up until you know, the early 1900s was not part of the United States. It, it was even right around the time of World War I. And the country functioned um, as, as far as our history books tell us. But to improve the lives of the American people, you have to take a look at something like income tax. And you have to look at that as being something that uh, that is over really state its welcome. By, by having income tax, it has flipped the script on the government working for us, and now we are literally working for the government. And if we were to abolish the income tax, you're going to find people that are keeping much more of their paychecks. And when you keep much more of your paycheck, uh, I would I would personally say that I'd be a much happier person. Um, my life would improve because now I have I would have money to invest. Um, I would have money to spend, uh, which would ultimately help businesses in general because now with such a high demand with people having more money in their pocket, feeling much better about their wallet, uh, more likely to spend it. Uh, businesses will expand. Businesses will have to hire. Um, you know, our economy will go through the roof, but then going back to my, my point before, if we can find those ways and find those ways to cut, then there's no reason to have income tax, to have something that gets taken out of, the U.S. citizens' paycheck every single week to just watch our national debt and our government get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, would you reduce spending uh, of the border? Uh, and uh, what is your position on immigration as a whole? Well, Im immigration as a whole is, you know, as cliche as it might be to hear and might be to say, is that we are, the United States is a country of immigrants. Right. The the movement of people and ideas and commerce um, and cultures and all all the positives of immigration are absolutely necessary to a functioning country. The problem is that we can't be running an open border where it then becomes, again, a burden to the U.S. taxpayer. Um, if you want to come into this country and and I, I encourage it, there are the proper ways to do it. and. Right now, it is, I mean, you can, again, this is a topic that's brought up in every single, you know, going from president all the way down. You know, there there has to be a better way to do it. We have millions and millions of people here illegally. And I understand that not all of them are criminals. You know, some of them are literally just looking to get out of a very bad situation. And this is where, you know, their kind of last resort has taken them into breaking the law to enter another country. That I do have sympathy for because you are looking for a better life coming here. But through those cracks, we do have people that shouldn't be here, plain and simple. And we have a lot of people that are that are here really, you know, beating the the, the U.S. taxpayer to death. Um, 
doing what we can to help them and keep them here. That is something that, again, has to be uh, scaled uh, back, I should say. We have to have some level of, of finding the people that aren't supposed to be here, and we have to deport them and send them uh, back to any port of entry that they were. And they can, if they want to come back in, they could do it the legal way. Uh, we we've again gotten to a point where it is beyond excessive and it seems to be affecting, you know, if not all 50 states, we have to be close to 50 states. And in New Jersey, we're obviously con considerably worried about that, considering how close we are to New York. Um, <clears throat> New York seems at a time to be running their own open border. And that's just something that that does leak down here into New Jersey. And that's something that that has to be addressed at a federal level. We can't be running this open border that we've been running. It's it's gotten far too out of control. Um, uh, so, from your experience, uh, how have uh, voters been responding to your message? Um, I would say, honestly, that since I I started my website. Now, when I ran for state legislature last year, I didn't I didn't have a website. You know, I relied solely this is, on this is your on second campaign Instagram. this is my second campaign yes yeah. so i did a lot of you know this I'll, I'll speak on last year and then i'll speak on this year but last year i i did a lot of the grassroots kind of approach because i'd i'd seen you know some campaigns in the past especially third party campaigns and not just libertarians third party campaigns in general um especially me as a voter in the past, you, you don't, it's not that you laugh, but you kind of get to the ballot box and you see all of these names and you were really only shown two, right. And you, you, you see that like, wow, the list is actually significantly longer. And I said to myself that if I'm going to go for this, um, this is something I'm going to take very, very seriously. So, you know, as limited as, as it was running for state legislature, you know, we, I did the yard signs, I did the door knocks, I did the drops in the mailbox. I dropped pamphlets, you know, in, in every shopping cart and windshield I could find in my district. Um, and I think, I think my number kind of, uh, reflected that we have in my district, my legislative district, we had about 400 to 500 registered, li registered libertarians. And I, I was able to pull in 1200 votes, which is a little over 1%. Um, but I think that that's proof that I was kind of reaching out or at least my name was as out there as it could be to independent voices, right? Since we, they're the ones that you want to grab the most, the ones that haven't registered or at least affiliated with any party. Um, so I, I, I'm hoping that the, the little, you know, the, that 1% name recognition that I had in my legislative district could expand bigger to, um, my congressional district. Now, I, as I was saying before, I didn't have I didn't have a website when I ran for state legislature. I have one now, and I'll tell you that I have, on average, probably six to seven emails a week just with questions on my policies and things that I love to get because that gives me, you know, something to talk to, or somebody to talk to, and something to talk about. Um, and you know, whether they're in my district or not, or they're just somebody that that is kind of just scrolling through uh, uh, congressional candidates, I don't care because it's something that I can kind of reach out to people to and talk about. So I would say I, I can't really quantify like how my message is being received, but I could tell you that in comparison from last year to this year, I'm definitely talking more to people, um, whether that be, you know, face to face. I, I have a few podcasts coming up um, that I'll be uh, a part of. Um, so my name as much as I you know like to boost my own ego, I think it's out there far more than it was a year ago. And I and I think the exposure will only grow. And that's exciting. So I and whether people agree with my message or not, you know, I think that that's uh important that uh the conversation and the discourse is there. Uh going back to free speech, what would you do in Congress to preserve this? Uh, these support social media platforms censoring content. Um, I do not in any way support social media platforms censoring any content. Um, and I, I said this in my my League of Women Voters panel. People forget that hearing or reading things. It's it's you, you have to take the time to consume content, and if you're going to take the time to consume content just to hate it, and just to kind of go back at it or look for a reason to be offended, 
then you're going about it the entire wrong way. The beauty of living in this country is that you can choose to not read or hear the things that you don't want to hear. So censoring social media content doesn't really make any sense to me when the human being can censor that themselves. So for the government to step in, especially Congress to step in to something like social media and to get even close to the, to the realm of censorship makes no sense. So that, that to me says that Congress and the powers that be don't think very highly of the U.S. citizen, don't think very highly of the intelligence of the U.S. Of the US citizen. If they think they have to be sheltered and spoon fed the content that they think won't offend them. Um, but that's why if for Congress to preserve that, that right of social media to, not, to have uncensored content, I think Congress can preserve it by just not getting involved. Uh, there shouldn't be regulation for that. Yeah, well, what would you do to make sure that the, uh, that the executive bureaucracy isn't uh, trying to put pressure on these social media companies? We kind of call it uh, Thomas Becketing where they're like, uh, well, no one helped me get rid of this meddlesome priest, but you know they're going to the social media companies and they're saying, uh, "Well, no one take care of this misinformation that's out there." Well, that's that. I mean, the the executive bureaucracy can, of course, have a, a relationship with the business, but in getting themselves their their hands in what that that platform can put out and expose people to should never even be a conversation. So do I do understand that like the, you know, our our uh, uh, elected officials would love and have absolutely we've seen Mark Zuckerberg even admit to it, have their hand in uh, getting information out that they think is more beneficial to their elections or to their party. Those are conversations that should never happen, that our executive power should never have that kind of ability or even that uh, opportunity to be to have that kind of influence um so that that is just something that has to be addressed at you know a a federal and nationwide level in like i said before there shouldn't be a any type of control over you know social media and content and that is scary it, you know as, as i said as i said before mark zuckerberg admitted to it so you have this mounting pressure from the powers that be, and that is that's something that has to be addressed on a nationwide scale. More exposure to the people trying to do that, the better. Um, how uh, how can people help your campaign? Um, well, to to help my campaign at all is is really to to keep sending me questions, keep going to moreforcongress.com and allowing me to either answer these questions that, that helps me produce more content uh you know through through proudlibertarian.com i was able to set up a shop and um i'm not keeping a, a penny of any t-shirt or any mug or any sticker sold it's all about just you know getting my campaign out there and getting my message out there um i will not be taking home you know a single cent from any t-shirt or anything that is sold so that is that's all through my website and moreforcongress.com that's that's a way to kind of get involved um, and that is, you know, something that 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 is the way to reach out to people and people to to reach out to me. Um, what other questions have been submitted through your website? Oh, so kind of to, to circle back a little bit um, at the uh, political panel, I did um, I, I my closing my closing statement uh, was. Uh, I talked about how if, if you are find yourself in chronic pain, right? It's, imagine you find yourself in chronic pain and you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you, you know, there, I have a bunch of remedies that, that could help, but I really can only offer you a red pill or a blue pill. And you take the red pill and not only do your symptoms, you know, not go away, it's actually getting worse. So you go back to the doctor and you go, you know what? I think I'll try that blue pill that you were pushing. And you find the same exact results. And, and I asked the audience, I go, at what point would you go to the doctor and, you know, say, why don't I try maybe a third option or a fourth option? Because, you know, by limiting my choices, it seems like I'm not expanding what could possibly be my cure. And after that went live, um, so it wasn't really questions I got. It was just more people uh, kind of giving their feedback, saying they haven't really, they didn't really think of it um, that way. 
um, in a way that made it like so kind of personal that these choices are you really are limited by what you could see. Um, but in terms of of actual questions I've gotten, being a public school teacher, I I get it all the time as uh, you know, what my stance on education is. And, and that's something I can speak of, you know, firsthand, again, being a public school teacher, I, I'm a, pro I'm a product of public schools. There is an absolute value in public schools. You know, Thomas Jefferson said, you know, that the, the most, you know, dangerous weapon or the, the, the most powerful force in the world is an educated populace. Uh, but our issues with our public education system really to me start with uh, curriculum control and the bigger um, scope of that is not being able to um, assess students and children the way that we should so for example i'm told every single day to differentiate my instruction in the classroom right because not every single student learns the same way you know i was a terrible test taker some some students are fantastic test takers and they might not be good at you know more um, group projects or or you know uh, analytical things <clears throat> but yet all of our students are expected to same take the same exact standardized test this is where our department of education kind of gets it wrong and and i i am not for uh you know sl a really slashing funding of public schools um because again i believe in an educated populace i believe that that uh, we are much better off the smarter we are and the more exposed to ideas we are. But we do have a problem in the way that we assess our students. And in that kind of uh, reflection, we have a terrible way of of observing and reflecting on our districts. Um, but that is something that could be taken you know, nationwide. You think students in New Jersey aren't learning the same way or learn the same things as students in Mississippi. But yet we have a Department of Education. Um, that kind of oversees all of this. Um, but the like kind of going back to what I what I'd said, I think we need to start at a level of of how are we assessing our our students and how are we making sure that they're, you know, learning more than what we think they need to learn. Uh, how would you reform education on the federal level? Would you remove the federal Department of Education? Uh, that's that's another one that either needs to be cut or it needs to be um, severely reduced. Um, like I said, students in New Jersey aren't learning the same way as as students in other states. All right. So to have this kind of nationwide umbrella doesn't really make much sense. So I think the Department of Education could absolutely be scaled back um, significantly and given more to the statewide level, and even in that sense, more to the local level. What uh, agencies would you cut first? Um, in terms of agencies to cut, I think w we all might read from the, the same mindset is that there has to be assessments of our, our three letter agencies um, in the United States. So that goes with, you know, the CIA, the FBI, all things that that have to be kind of scaled back significantly. There's there, you know, agencies that have far too much power that are uh, not always behaving in the best interest of the United States. Uh, so those are those are a few that I would uh, have to assess pretty pretty quickly and to see how quickly I could cut their funding. Um, but that's that's where I would start. Um, so as we head to the end of this interview, uh, I would like for you to give, uh, your elevator pitch in about a span of three minutes. Uh, could you, could you provide a statement as for why people should vote for you and, um, and, and yeah, and, and any other information that you feel is, is pertinent? Absolutely. Um, yes. So my, my, my elevator pitch is really not just for me my my pitch will always be for people to expand please please expand your political horizons you are you are not just left you're not just right you know there are times that you could be both if you look at our party at, at the libertarian party at times we are conservative on certain things we're conservative on certain things we we're liberal and i think that that's the majority of americans i believe americans aren't just 
a conservative, aren't just a liberal. I think that given the topic, you might find yourself in one way or the other. You might find yourself left. You might find yourself right. You might find yourself moderate. So really to use this time, I, I really want people to kind of do what I did, which was I was tired of going to the ballot box and just kind of narrowing down this entire you know, long ballot into just two choices. Take the time in between elections or even during the election season and look at your ballot and look these people up on your own. See what they have to say. And you, you, you'll always get the, the people that are going to push back to you and say you're wasting your vote because you're not voting for a Republican or a Democrat. That couldn't be farther from the truth. All right. I, I would rather be a person and I would rather people be the, the type of person to vote based on their beliefs and based on the things that they follow and the things that they think will help this country, as opposed to, I'm just going to vote for this person because they're the lesser of two evils, or I'm just going to vote for this person because they've already won several times. So why not vote for them again? So not, not wanting to give too much of a pitch on myself. I just, I want people to really do what I did and expand your political horizons. Look into the things that, that you find to be important. And I guarantee you, you're going to find a candidate or somebody to follow or somebody to support that is outside of that, the two pot, the two party system, right? So continue to kind of do those things. Don't just go on November 5th without looking any of these things up. I, I guarantee you, you're going to find something new about somebody running, whether that's, you know, uh, president, whether that's Senate, whether that's Congress, whether that's your school board, you know, take the time to look this, these things up. And I promise you, you'll, you'll surprise yourself in, in finding somebody new and maybe a party that's new. Um, that could change the the outlook and the way that you see the world and the things that you find are important. All right. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, John Morrison running for House of Representatives, New Jersey District 4. All right. Thank you. Thank you.